morning. Uh, my name is George Breslauer. I'm the faculty director of the Magnus, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here, uh, where the preservation and communication of uh, the history of Jewish life throughout the global diaspora is what we do. And today we celebrate a diasporic success story. Noah Albert and his founding of Noah's Bagel, both the bagel and the chain, the chain of 38 retail outlets and a wholesale operation. Noah built Noah's Bagels into what was then the largest kosher retail outlet in the United States. Not only did he put his bagels into the mainstream of American urban culture, he also decided that Jews must not be afraid to be, as he puts it, quote, unapologetically Jewish. And so he hung a mezuzah on the door of each of those 38 Noah's Bagel outlets. Noah Alper is a legend in our community. Who here has never tasted a Noah's Bagel? I imagine nobody will raise your hand. <laughs> Either because you didn't or because you're ashamed to admit it. But, but did you also know that Noah coined the term schmear as a synonym for the cream cheese that we, well, schmear onto our bagels? Noah Alper is a man of many pursuits. He's been a business entrepreneur and consultant, a philanthropist, the author of a book, Business Mensch, in which he shares the story of his entrepreneurship and of the values and the strategies that drove his success. He's also a valued friend of the Magnus. He has donated to, to this institution the archive of his business during the eight years in which he owned Noah's Bagel, before selling it uh, in the late 1990s. You can see some items from that archive on display today in what I mentioned before of the conference room and the Helsel study room off the lobby. Having this archive at the Magnus will allow students and faculty to use it as a research base for studying a diasporic success story for studying how Noah's bagels got conceived, built, and expanded throughout the country. We want to thank Noah Alper also for underwriting the costs of our curating the archive and for under underwriting the costs of today's event. So now, without further delay, Noah Alper. sit down now, and uh, you would have heard everything that I have to say, but George, I want to thank you very much for your, for your kind words. I, I also want to thank uh, Francesco uh, Spagnolo, the, uh, the uh, director of uh, the Magnus Collection, who couldn't be here today, as well as the support staff, Eric Nelson in particular, and uh, our chef in the back, Alan Finkelstein, uh, who put on a informed me that I was one of the most difficult uh, clients he's ever had. I insisted that the bagels be from New York and hot and crusty, and Alan delivered on that, and I want to thank him very much. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, to say that, uh, George, thank you uh, indeed for all of your, your compliments, but really, this was, a it was a, an entire team effort, uh, and uh, I want to thank my father, who was the, really the inspiration for all of my success um, in giving us uh, a perspective that it's never about you, it's always about the team. And, and I say that with, with all sincerity. Uh, so to start the Noah's Bagel story, um, it did, it, it was, while it was built, or, or uh, first door established in 1989, um, the story really begins in 1984 at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. My sister and I were swinging divorcees on a, on a lark, and uh, where are we going to go? We'll go to Israel. 
And so we went to Israel and we're at the Western Wall and, you know, doing what Jews do. We go to the Western Wall. All of a sudden, an Asia Torah guy with the, the black robes and, you know, the whole business comes over and, come and see my yeshiva. You have, you'll be so interesting. They're having a shiur. And, and I'm like, Judy, no, I'm not, I'm not going. And she says to me, and we came, by the way, from a secular slash reform home. In, in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, so coming from her, I, it was absolutely a shock. She looks at me and she says, when you're in Spain, you go to a bullfight, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that's right. She says, well, you're at the Western Wall, you're in Jerusalem, you should go to this yeshiva. So not being able to answer, you know, why I could go to a bullfight in Spain and not a yeshiva in Israel, I decided, all right, you know, I'll go to the yeshiva. Well, that was really the beginning of the road, because it was um, uh, Noah um, Weinberg, who was the founder of Asia Torah, who was an amazing speaker, and had sold, I found out later, ladies' handbags as a college student. So this guy could sell anything, including Judaism, to somebody as far away from it as I was. Um, one lecture got me turned on. Um, it reminded me, as I was thinking about it this morning, that which is which is following from the the, uh, the Jewish holiday season and Breshi in, in particular. We talk about the world. God created the world out of speech. God said, "Let there be light." It was light. That's a speech in Jewish tradition is hugely important. What we say, how we say it. So one phrase, you know. Uh, if you're in Spain, you go to a bullfight. You're in Jerusalem, you should go to a yeshiva. Really changed my life. I went to the yeshiva, I heard the lecture, got very turned on, got very interested, uh, especially in Zionism and, and Israel. Um, but to a lesser extent, my curiosity was piqued about the tradition itself. I get back um, to Berkeley. It was a pre-arranged move from the, uh, from the East Coast. And I decide I have to do something really powerful for uh, the state of Israel. I had heard at that time from uh, Ronald Reagan over the, over the airwaves that uh, one third of Americans had admitted to a born again Christian conversion. So I'm converting the conversion of a, a third of Americans into possibly a business opportunity of selling tchotchkes from the Holy Land to this, you know, 80 odd million people. So, Foods from the Holy Land was born. And uh, I gotta tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it was probably the most dismal failure of any business in, you know, the history of the universe. Nothing went right about that business, and I could go into some, some really large detail about it, but just suffice it to say, um, I didn't know my customers, I didn't know the products, the products that I got were flawed. Uh, I could, again, speak volumes about it, but um, what happened was it just failed and I failed and I felt failed and I was depressed and I was, you know, what do I do with my life? Um, by that time, we had uh, two kids and a third on the way and it was sort of um, get real time. Uh, looked at businesses to buy, nothing really, you know, you know, little businesses for sale is usually a reason why they're for sale. Uh, <laughs> so, around this time, my brother Spike comes over to me and says, um, I got a business for you. He said, I've just come back from Montreal, I want you, I want you to see this video, I want a video camera about like this. And on the video camera, he shows me a, a Willy Wonka of bagels up in Montreal, where they're going around the chute, and they're coming around the other end, and you ought to do this in Berkeley. And I, oh boy, you know, I've never baked anything in my life. Anything you have to measure is a problem for me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. Um, he said, take a look at it. Just take a look at it and, 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 and look into it. And, you know, as a big brother, you do what you're told. You know, I'm the little brother. He tells you to go take a look at it. I took a, took a look at it. Went, traveled around the East Coast, uh, New York in, in particular, um, family contacts, and, and uh, spent a year at this, including uh, eventually a location search here, here in Berkeley. 
And I found a bagel that was fantastic in, in Western Massachusetts, and uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, I could actually do this. Uh, I also thought about the fact that uh, the Bay Area had fantastic ethnic cuisine of all sorts, but not a great bagel. So there were a lot of things that lined up really well about it. But before I even got to that point, um, there, there was a notion of uh, giving up the, the Zionist dream of, of you know, building this business that was going to help the state of Israel. And wrestling with this, with this notion of, you know, this isn't about Israel. But I said, well, but it's Jewish. Hello? <laughs> so, you know, there was, there was a logical bridge between, uh, you know, the, the, the Holy Land gifts and whatever I wanted to do in terms of strengthening the economy of Israel and being, you know, virulent and, and actually doing something that was interesting, that had, had some real potential, and certainly had um, a, a Jewish flavor to it. And, and that's something uh, that I think, as George alluded to, was really a centerpiece of the business, was its sort of um, Jewish soul, uh, which we fostered and nurtured and, and, and discovered that people really related to it, that there was, there was an authenticity about it, about what we were doing, um, in, including the fact that it was kosher. And how it got to be kosher was coming back from uh, these explorations and deciding I was going to do it, I got put in touch with Rabbi Ferris, who I'm not sure is here today, but um, of Berkeley Chabad, and he worked me in you know, everything that Noah Weinberg started working me with in Jerusalem. He finished the job. Um, you know, like a hand around the neck, and, 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 you know, and I decided that, uh, you know, if I wanted to have uh, my friend Yehuda uh, over for a bagel at my place, it's going to have to be kosher. There was a larger, there was a larger issue, which I'm not sure I fully identified at the time, uh, but looking back at it, was a sense of inclusivity, a sense of a big Jewish tent, if you will, um, that everybody should feel welcome. Um, and, and honored and respected, and that would include those that kept kosher and that, those that didn't keep uh, kosher, but at least it was a milieu, it was a platform um, that, that enabled the entire Jewish community to get together and, and feel good. I mean, I, you know, it's been written, but it was really true that for a lot of people, our bagel store on Sunday morning was the equivalent of uh, going to synagogue. I mean, that's where they hung out, that's where they got inspiration, that's where they met their neighbors. Um, so it was, you know, it was, uh, it was an important thing for them. Um, the store itself, I had seen, you know, in the, in the course of my travels, uh, all of these appetizing stores, and only New Yorkers know what appetizing stores are, uh, um, which for the rest of us is dairy delis, if you will. Uh, all kinds of smoked fish, all kinds of cheeses, pickles, anything that, uh, it had nothing to do with meat and had to do with Jewish. It was in there. The Kogels and stuff like that. So I saw these fantastic appetizing stores and of course I saw the great bagels that were in New York and wanted to bring those, bring those west. Decided to combine the two things. So we had sable and getting people hungry even though we already eaten. You know, we had smoked blue fish. We had three kinds of herrings. I remember in particular um, I'd get into the first door about, you know, five in the morning or so. Noah, we need you to taste the herring. We're not sure it's good. So, professional eating, five o'clock in the morning, a pickled herring in the mouth. Okay, it passes. Let's go on. Um, that was, you know, the beginnings of, of, uh, of Noah's Bagels. Uh, we had pictures of old New York because beyond the, you know, it was all Jewish New York. Let's put it that way. We had pictures from um, one of our congregants uh, at Beth Israel, or the, the fish lady is out. Uh, and then later on we had, you know, the bar mitzvah boy with all the watches up his arm. Uh, you know, some of you can remember some of these great photos that we, uh, uh, that we had in the store. And, and basically, um, the, the, the person who drove the, the, the photographic uh, end of the business um, as well as a, a whole lot of the business, which I'll go into describe later, was my brother Spike. Uh, because a year later, after uh, 
the first store was established, excuse me, we joined together uh, along with Bob Polsky, who I understand is also in the house, um, and it created a very complicated and convoluted uh, licensing arrangement whereby uh, Spike and Bob were going to open stores and I was going to run the marketing and the uh, production and the wholesale. And we worked under that framework for a couple of years until um, it was actually two different companies. Um, Spike and Bob brought in a seasoned, uh, it wasn't really seasoned, but he was bright, <laughs> a bright young whippersnapper um, who knew a whole lot more about uh, running a big business, certainly, than I did or, or anybody else in the company did. And he was put on and, and beat on all of us to join the companies together, um, with which we wound up doing. So we, we joined uh, P&A Ventures, or something along those lines, along with Noah's Bagels, and we made one company out of it. It turns out to be uh, it was, a, was absolutely the right decision because we were, for a number of reasons, in terms of financing, in terms of um, uh, attracting great people, uh, and, and being able to really you know, scale the business, which we, which we wound up doing. Um, as George alluded to, uh, and, and what I tried to say uh, in introductory remarks, is unapologetically Jewish was the sort of the, the watchword. Um, of the company, we had we didn't have bagel sticks. We had bagel sticks. We didn't we didn't have bagel spreads. We had bagel schmears. Um, and I drew the line at sprouts. When they talked about bringing in sprouts, I said if the sprouts come in, I go out. So we didn't have sprouts. We had holiday pamphlets with, describing all the holidays. Again, many people coming into the into the stores were either vaguely familiar or or pretty much unfamiliar with, with uh, our own traditions. This was a way of doing something in the way of education. We had holiday items for sale. Uh, we had sadaka boxes, charity boxes in every store. We gave um, the uh, proceeds to uh, Mazon, which was a Jewish response to hunger. I remember that was interesting. We also had an employee tip jar that sat next to the tzedakah box, and we'd always have kind of tug of wars between which box got, you know, front and center in the consumer's mind, the tzedakah box or the employee tip box. But that was important to us as well, was taking care of our employees. And again, I think my brother would, would readily admit that learning about team effort uh, and treating people well and treating employees well was something that certainly, certainly was a, uh, a great, great and important factor in, in making that business successful. We ran all kinds of other programs too at the store. Came to the realization we had the better part of a thousand people a day coming through these stores. I mean, the traffic was, was amazing. Um, so we harnessed the power of that, of that traffic for things which uh, Jim Mises, who's here, uh, and I, decided was the higher thing. That's how we referred to it, was what can we do in this business that um, can help the world, if you will. Grandiose, you know, terminology, but it was something we took seriously. And what I found um, was so encouraging was you have, for the most part, we had, at the end we had a thousand employees. Many of them were young high school and college and college dropouts and looking for themselves type people and mostly you go into stores and you know you you see these people every day in the course of your lives and they're all like Bleh. you know could care less about you could care less about what they're selling checked out our people weren't like that they were sprightly and brightly and, and animated and what, it, and what really animated them, and this is what really shocked me, was when we got involved in these tzedakah um, projects. Uh, we would enlist their support, their input, their, their comments. We would have competitive, you know, who can develop, uh, who can help the world more than who in terms of various regions. And we found these kids who, were, you know, who, who, who in another milieu might be checked out to be very, very engaged and very alive. And that was a, a very thrilling thing that, that we were able to, um, to put together. I, I think that, that um, 
you know, it all it all kind of cap I, I can encapsulate kind of the mood of the store of the stores rather because eventually we got from that one store on College Avenue to 37 more of them. We had 38 stores from Los Angeles to Seattle, so it was it became a you know quite a, quite a substantive business. I wanted to spell the rumor that I was running it. Um, I was like, if you, if you use the ship analogy, I was the rudder, um, but I certainly wasn't the steering wheel. We had a lot of other people that were much better at steering the boat than I was, but I tried to keep us on course, if you will. I eventually became sort of a Jewish Colonel Sanders, which is basically my, <laughs> that was my real job. Um, but um, I think I paid for it, which is even better. But, but getting back to, I think, you know, what sort of was emblematic of, of how we did business um, from a Jewish perspective and from our, our sort of, you know, overall ethos was around our grand openings. We eventually, you know, um, Jim came from a background of, of Taco Bell and he ran something like 500 Taco Bells in the Southwest region. And he knows about Rolo. You know, he's a he's a he's a rollout machine, and we were we were in our own right rolling out stores. You know, in the in the order of one every other week, something like that, towards the end. Um, so we had to ritualize and to and to um, uh, what's the word? You know, carbon copyize these some of these things that we did, including the grand opening uh, ceremonies. And so what we would do is we would hire a klezmer band. We would affix a mezuzah to the door. We would have some kosher champagne. And then we'd break into a hora and we'd dance around the store. And we were in some areas, I gotta tell you folks, they had never seen a Jewish person. You know, much less Jews dancing around and men holding arms and putting up little things on the door. I mean, the whole thing was, was very alien to some of these communities we went into. But the authenticity was celebrated. And I think what was um, almost more important than uh, the, the party that we had was the next day. All of the employees that um, uh, would open a new store would go out and do a service project even before we, we actually opened the doors for business. And in that way, you know, we demonstrated to the community who we were, what we stood for, and we also demonstrated that for our employees, and they got it. And so we were, you know, the, the ethos around which the company was built was able to, you know, to perpetuate to, to yet the next door um, by means of, of uh, ritualizing uh, some of the things we did that were really uh, profound and important for, uh, for not only for our community, but for our suppliers uh, and for our um, customers. So I, I want to uh, sort of uh, wind down uh, in the way of a story. Um, and I think this, this um, kind of, in another way, says who we were as a company. Um, started out the business, this is a Jewish company, Jewish world, and how do we navigate that? And it's not easy. It's not easy for, uh, for any of us uh, to navigate that world in the Jewish community. Um, we're a small people, we're an endangered species, we're all very focused on endangered animals, but as a, as a, as a people we're an endangered species. Uh, there's a lot of assimilation, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, let's go out there and find out what's out there, and not sometimes look what's precious uh, and, and uh, important uh, in our own tradition. So we were determined to keep, you know, Noah's Bagel is a Jewish company. And so around, around that, this is a Hanukkah's coming up, so I think this is a, you know, it, it, it is, it's kind of a good segue. Um, we, we had to navigate and negotiate uh, around um, Christmas, okay? Christmas and Jews, you know, that's fireworks. Um, so we finally came to an agreement where, this was in our offices in uh, Alameda, that, that the employees could have whatever they wanted around their own desk, but in the public spaces in the, in the two buildings that, uh, that were in our offices would be no 
Christmas trees and no, you know, it would be Hanukkah decorations and then when Hanukkah was over they would be removed and that was that, because that's who we were. Well, there were some people in the other building who decided that they wanted a Christmas tree in the middle of the room. And uh, Jim came over to me and said, no, I got a good little problem in building two. <laughs> And I, what's that, Jim? Well, we've got something that's very large and green and has branches. And some little stuff coming off of it. Um, I said, well, Jim, what are we going to do? He said, don't worry about it. No, it won't be there by the weekend. I said, well, okay, Jim. So sure enough, I came back, you know, after the weekend and went next door. And I didn't see anything at all. So his name is Jim Mises, but really, if you think about it, J.M., Judah Maccabee, you know, maybe there's a connection. Um, Jim and the, and the crew and, the, and the, uh, my family uh, made Noah's bagels uh, uh, way, way more than I did. And I want to, you know, I want to call out a few of those individuals. Um, in particular, my brother Spike. Uh, and I want to just... I just, want to, I just want to say a few, Spike, stand up for just a second, if you would. Stand up. Because, you know, being the brother of a famous person isn't easy, you know? Um, I, I want to say that, you know, it's the role of a big brother to sort of bust the chops of a younger brother. And Spike did a really good job at that. So I, I, wanted to, I wanted to thank him. But I also wanted to say, in his own way, and I, I would, in big quotes, he had my back, and has always had my back. And I wanted to make that really clear. And I also wanted to say, in terms of the, in terms of the success of the business, um, when he came into the business, you know, Noah's Bagel started on its uh, ascendancy. Left on my own devices, I wouldn't be here this morning, I'd be schlocking bagels in the, in the back room at College Avenue. Uh, because I had no concept of uh, administration and finance, anything, anything with a number got me nervous, you know, to look at. Um, much less his real estate expertise. Uh, he would put pieces together into that business uh, that left to my own devices. I, I was uh, totally clueless. So I, I, I give him um, absolutely equal credit uh, for Noah's, if not more credit, because after all, it was his idea. Um, I was describing this to a teacher of mine, um, and he said, you know, this is the Moses and Aaron story all over again. If anybody remember the, the history, you know, God says to Moses, you know, bring the, bring the Jewish people out of Egypt. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. It's not for me. He argues. And God says, well, what if uh, Aaron does the talking? Okay, then we got a deal. So we got a negotiator, we got a closer, we got we got divisions, and we got we got a situation where you know strengths are built you know uh, amongst people uh, for whom uh, there's no or little strength in one area and much in another, and by a, a symbiotic relationship, uh, something something amazing can be can be developed. Uh, I also want to thank my three uh, boys for putting up with me during all of this. I remember thinking, they're old enough that I could admit it now. I came into the house one day, and I came to this, it was really an epiphany. I don't know if that's a Jewish expression, but anyway. Um, I said, you know, in my mind, they're minor annoyances. You know, they were like five and seven and whatever. And I'm like, I don't think this is a good way to look at my children. So I decided that, you know, I needed to have a little bit of a, you know, paradigm shift uh, in how I looked at them. And uh, thank God, you know, I have. I've come around. I, I love them. Um, my son, my uh, oldest son, Jesse, who I believe is in the house, and maybe could stand in the back. Okay. Um, He's about to make a new life in Eretz Yisrael. Very pleased with that, with his Israeli wife. Uh, my middle son, David, who uh, maybe could stand if he's in the house. Uh, middle son, David, and his lovely wife, Mama, making their way in the business world in, uh, in New York and, and, and Brooklyn. Um, and uh, my youngest son, uh, Robbie, 
who's a uh, virtual sales machine for Cisco, uh, Cisco Meraki in San Francisco, and who's about to celebrate uh, his 27th birthday tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I wanted to thank, last, but far, far, far from least, least my lovely wife, Hope, who I hope will stand. I started to think about it. I'm starting this business. Um, she's seven months pregnant, okay, when I'm starting this business. I was, ladies and gentlemen, absent, you know, for the better part of seven years. Uh, they knew who I was, but barely. Um, she held it all together and gave me the, the confidence and the stability and the encouragement to do what I needed to do. So, hope. It's all about you. As well, though, and she's the, I'm the poser. All right, I admit it. Uh, I also, you know, alluded to it before, but I wanted to say again that it was about a team effort. It was, and it was uh, uh, everybody that was involved. Now there are some former nose people here in the house, and if I've forgotten you. Um, Please stand up, and I'm going to name some names here. Uh, my son Jesse was an employee. Spike, of course. Everybody stand up, please. Jesse, Spike, Anita Levich from Solano Avenue is here. Robin Candler is hopefully here. Mac Alley is here. Mac, stand up. Bob Polsky, please stand up. Jim Mises, of course. Linda Duke is here in the house. Uh, Nancy Hauge, is she here? She said she'd try to make it. And we even, I believe, have the Bagel Boy. Is John O'Finger here? No. Okay, well, the Bagel Boy was uh, supposed to be here. And uh, so there we are. And I wanted to thank uh, all of our NOAA's employees, everybody who made NOAA successful, including all of our fabulous customers. It was a moment in time, folks. Um, I think that, you know, we're a people built on memory. I mean, that's what we, that's what we celebrate, that's how we keep our traditions alive. And I think the Noah's experience, the, the six and a half, seven odd year experience that we had in the Bay Area, there were little moments, just like my sister gave me that, that one sentence of, of inspiration, which she didn't even know where it came from herself, I'm sure, that, that redirected my life. I'm sure in the course of the seven years of Noah's, we touched a lot of other people's lives, and hopefully um, our people and, uh, and all of humanity in some fashion was this much affected by what we did during that time and place. So, thank you very much. Um, we, brought in, we brought in New York bagels. Help yourselves. There's artifacts to look at. And uh, thank you very much for coming out today.